My name is Tom Tresser, and I'm the Green Party candidate for Cook County Board President, but I am not here to talk to you about uh, the county government and the, uh, the, the scandals and the uh, other uh, uh, garbage that's been going on there. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about the uh, bid for the 2016 Olympics, which actually uh, led me to my race. Uh, I teach college at uh, DePaul and IIT. I teach civics. I teach public uh, policy. I'm actually teaching a class now called Who's Lying to You Now? Uh, uh. Introduction to Critical Thinking and Media Literacy. I think that would go over well with this group. I think you're all into a critical thinking um, and, um, and literacy. Uh, I came here in 1980 to be a member of the Illinois Shakespeare Festival, so I'm really not by any stretch of the means a politician. I used to be a theater producer uh, and a community organizer. Now one of the things that I'm really interested in is uh, something called the commons. And the commons uh, is that which belongs to us all uh, and is to be held in perpetuity for future generations. And it goes back to the uh, Roman times and even before that, where um, there was pasture land or uh, land that was needed for the community. And uh, say uh, you needed to raise an animal and you didn't have enough land, you put it on the commons. And the commons didn't belong to any one person, belonged to the community, but everybody was responsible for maintaining it. Uh, and there was, you know, you know the legend of Robin Hood? Well, Robin Hood started because uh, the king took over the forests and people were being prosecuted for hunting in what used to be the commons, something that was owned by everybody. Today, we think of the commons as sort of um, the environment, the air, um, the water, uh, and now even the internet. The internet is something with the new commons, not owned by anyone, but shared by everyone, and to be protected for all by the use for all. And so um, that's something that's very important to me. And a, and a couple of years ago, I got involved in an issue in Lincoln Park where we found out that the Park District signed a secret deal with the Latin School. The Latin School is one of the most wealthiest institutions in uh, the area. It's a private school. It's right in Clark, 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 and North Avenue. And uh, the tuition is about $25,000 a year there. Uh, and um, they decided they needed a soccer field to enhance their reputation in enrollment. And they did a deal in the dead of night with the Park District to take about two and a half acres of prime lakefront land and turned it into an artificial turf soccer field for their use with a scoreboard, lights, uh, water fountain, and naming rights. So this, this would actually be, uh, they would be selling uh, pavers, you know, and they'd have a scoreboard, you know, with the uh, grocer auto and Pepsi-Cola and whatnot right there in the park. And it would be a huge money maker for them. And so this just happened, and we read about it, a group of neighbors, and we thought, this is not right. Uh, I'm sure uh, the park district was trying to make some money off of it, but it gives you the sense of, well, well why don't we just sell Lincoln Park to Disneyland? I mean, you know, Disneyland's got a lot of money. They, they could probably put a couple roller coasters and, you know, City City would make a, you know, good, good money. So, it's, but the problem is the land doesn't belong to the park district. The land doesn't belong to the mayor. It's ours. And the idea is that they're supposed to hold on to it and improve it not give it away. So a group of neighbors got together and we sued the Latin School and the Park District. And I have to tell you, the, the Latin School has got some pretty heavy hitters. So there's a guy named Laird Coldike, whose father, Martin Coldike, is a billionaire, owns an investment firm, and uh, uh, is a big donor to, to Mayor Daly. I think uh, uh, Mr. Coldike flew Mayor Daly down to the Super Bowl a couple years ago in their private jet. And uh, Laird Koldak is a member of the board of uh, the Park District. He's a commissioner. And he has children at the land school. So this is another situation where a private deal, benefiting insiders, done at the dead of night, and there's no chance to talk about it. Too bad for you if you disagree. Well, this group of neighbors got together. And when I say a group of citizens, we're talking about a retired stewardess, um, a copywriter, or a stay-at-home mom. Um, myself, uh, sort of a good government geek, um, an old community organizer from, Le from, from Lincoln Park, a retired lawyer, uh, just a group of neighbors. I mean, 
not only like the people sitting in this room right here, who just got pissed off. We raised eighty thousand dollars and we sued the Latin school, uh, and nobody thought we had a chance to win. Nobody thought we had a prayer. Uh, we drew a good judge named uh, Dorothy Kinnar. She's the chief of the Chancery Court, and she did her homework. And she uh, heard the facts, and uh, basically, to make a long story short, we, we run this one that suit. And that's, the contract with the Latin school was torn up. So that's unprecedented, never happened before. But here's the thing. When we went into court on April 24th of 2008, uh, there were 13 lawyers standing there. 13 lawyers. There was um, the law department. There was um, the legal department of the, of the park district. There were just two lawyers from the Latin school. And then there was a guy named um, John Simon, the chief partner of Jenner and Block. And Jenner and Block, as you may know, is a clout heavy firm that does a lot of work for a lot of different uh, heavy people in the city, a lot of different departments. They do a lot of contracts. And I think John probably bills out at $1,200 an hour. <laughs> but there he was, uh, arguing against this little group. We didn't even have a pot to piss in. We didn't have an office. We didn't have a phone. What were all these lawyers doing there, arrayed against us, uh, and, and, and urging us uh, to, to fold our tent and go away? They were there because if we had succeeded in getting an actual court judgment, it would have been the end of the Olympic bid. So this is where you connect the two stories. Because we have this trend in Chicago called privatization. And this is an example of privatization. Privatization is where you take something that belongs to everybody and give it to a few people for their private profit. Usually where the, uh, the, the public loses. And of course, the biggest example of this is what? Exactly. So who here thinks the parking meters was a good deal for the citizens? Raise your hand. The Skyway was the first deal. Uh, but yes, and uh, of course the, 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 the total is doubled on the, on the Skyway. But the parking meters is the biggest example of that. And um, we all know that uh, what do you drip off? Uh, Morgan Stanley is going to reap ten billion dollars over the life of that deal. Ten billion dollars. That's ten times what we got. So I'd say, uh, doing a crude math, I'd say we got screwed. So uh, the idea that the idea that um, privatization is something to be looked at is now not a hard issue to discuss. And so, if there would have been a court decision from this little issue with a soccer field in Lincoln Park. It would have said something like, before any more private pro public property can be turned over to private citizens, there has to be due process, there has to be some kind of procedure, that would have killed the Olympic bid. Instead, they settled out of court. We didn't have enough money to fight them all the way, and so there was no legal decision. So our prediction was, as uh, 2008 was wrapping up, that we were going to see the public parks involved in the Olympic bid. Well, on February 13th, 2009, the Olympic bid was unsealed. Uh, before that, it was part of a secret. No details were available. And sure enough, the details were revealed, and all the venues in Chicago's bid were public parks. And so, there you have it. Um, the city was, was postulating that we could save a lot of money by simply putting the venues in, in the public parks. So here's the uh, book of venues, and uh, let's take a look. So here's Washington Park. So Washington Park is a historic park. It was designed by the same guy that designed uh, Wash, uh, Central Park in New York City, my hometown, Frederick Law Homestead. And um, it is um, sort of sacred territory for the African-American community in Chicago. Uh, there's a long history there of gatherings, of cultural events, reunions, and festivals, um, and other, other things that are very meaningful to the African-American community. But you can see it'll be pretty much destroyed. Now, that's 
that's aside from what was going to happen in Lincoln Park by the bird sanctuary. So if any of you are birders or interested in wildlife, the tennis venue would have been put directly next to the bird sanctuary, pretty much blotting that out. Uh, parts of Douglas Park would have been obliterated, and the lakefront would have been off bounds from North Avenue to 32nd Street for seven years, and all the boarders displaced, where the city would have lost about $12 million in revenue from the building fees. So all these details were, were coming out, uh, as I say, as we were able to go through the bid. So a group of neighbors got together and said, you know, this is not right. You know, the, the, park, the park scale was bad enough, you know, where it was just one tiny little part of Lincoln Park. This is that on steroids. So uh, I, I came together with a group of neighbors and activists called No Games Chicago. So No Games Chicago launched its, uh, its attack on the bid on January 31st, 2009, with a forum in University of Illinois, and we had about 200 people show up. So before this, there's been no, there was nobody criticizing the bid. I mean, you have to understand, this was not a small project. This is something that would have changed the face of the city uh, forever, uh, at a cost of, we estimate, at least $10 million. Uh, so I was calling around um, in the fall of 2008 to other organizations around the city to say, well, what, what, what's your position? Uh, you know, Jewish Council of Urban Affairs, Friends of the Parks, Metropolitan Planning Council, uh, Chicago Rehab Network, um, the Heartland Institute, uh, Active Transport Alliance, all oh, just, just so many different groups, uh, neighborhood groups, groups that are supposed to be studying these things. And you know what they tell me? Oh, it's not on our radar screen. Oh, we're not studying this. It's nothing that concerns us. Or they would tell me privately, it's a terrible program, but we can't say anything about it. We can't speak out against this one. So we started to see that there's a pattern of intimidation uh, and um, sort of civic terrorism actually going on over the, throughout the uh, 2008, where uh, representatives of the bid and the mayor's office met with community groups up and down the city, promising them the sun, the moon, and the earth. You'll get jobs, you'll get affordable housing, you'll get a swimming pool, you'll get all sorts of things when the, bid, when the, when the, when the games come to town. Um, the 2016 committee was headed by Pat Ryan. Pat Ryan was the chair emeritus of Aon Insurance. Aon Insurance had been sued by Attorney General Spitzer in New York um, for uh, corrupt practices, and they settled for $114 million. Uh, but Pat was also a major contributor to Mayor Daly for about $100,000. And of course, Aon Insurance is also a major contractor with the city. There's a lot of insurance work. But the mayor called on Pat to head up the bid committee, and he pulled together a team that included uh, Dale's former chief of staff, Lori Healy, uh, Doug Arnott, who was the head of community development. And in fact, it looked like the bid committee was essentially City Hall uh, over on, uh, you know, at the AN building. So you already started, started to see the, 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 the boundaries between public and private being obliterated. In a sense, the Olympics privatizes this is your whole city. <laughs> so uh, we were up against this crew. The entire um, business community signed on to this. Most of the nonprofits, as I said, were not saying anything against the, this bid. And all the newspapers were editorializing. Uh, so if you read the, the Sun-Times Sun or the um, Tribune, you'd hear something like, well, you know, I know we have a lot of problems in Chicago, but if it could be done right, <laughs> you know, if, you know, I, I guess they were saying, you know, if Mayor Daly wasn't the mayor, or if Ed Burke wasn't the chair of the finance committee, and if we didn't have 32 older men in prison, you know, if it did, you know, it would be fabulous. But that's not the case. <laughs> we live in Chicago with generations of corruption so deeply embedded in this city that, um, you know, there's the Chicago way. I mean, you say the Chicago way, everybody knows what you're talking about. <clears throat> I'm reading a book right now about Al Capone called Get Capone. It's a fabulous book. Highly recommend it. Uh, which talks about the history of corruption and the how violence and, 
and uh, organized crime and politics have been intertwined in this city for 100 years. And it's no different now. So this is what we were up against. And we had not an office. We didn't have a phone. <laughs> we didn't have anybody who loved us. Uh, and yet we went from group to group, from community to meeting to community meeting. We put up a website, and we started to raise some hell. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you a secret. We had a spy. Nobody knows this. You're among the first to hear this. At the first community meeting that we did on January 31st, uh, a, a person came up to us. I'll, I'll call her Miss X, uh, who was deeply involved in Olympic politics and was, and was known to and knows members of the IOC. But this person was so upset about the idea of Chicago hosting the, the games that she said, I will give you the benefit of my knowledge to help you plan your strategy. And it was hugely successful. So here's the first one of the first lessons that we learned. Even though we were vastly outnumbered, sort of like David and Goliath, we were better messengers. We were better strategists than the 2016 committee itself. We figured out the way to influence the, the game uh, better than Mayor Daly and his people. Which is ironic because the mayor and his people are supposed to be the experts in head counting and uh, button rolling and arm twisting and nose counting. And they, they failed. So we set about to, to, to essentially try to change the course of history with very little resources with all this stuff arrayed against us. It's impossible. It seemed, um, in some points, insane. Uh, it seemed that sometimes that uh, we were the only voices of sanity, you know, like the, the fable of the boy and the emperor who has no clothes. Everybody's looking at the emperor going, oh, what a fabulous, what a fabulous uh, outfit you have on, Mr. Daly. What a great, what a great project the Olympics is. We're looking at it going, what the hell? This is bogus. So here are the reasons why we oppose the bid. Here are the reasons why. By the way, are, are there people here who thought the games would have, would have been a great thing? Please repeat your question. Uh, are there people here who thought the games would have been great for Chicago? Question yeah. Joe. Oh. I'm from the Burns, though, that's why. All right, there's a few people who raised their hands. Charlie has his hand up. Yeah, I see a few people. Um, that's usually how it is. There's usually a few who, 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 who think the games are a good thing. Um, we did not think so. Here's the reasons why. First, they would have ruined us financially. The games lose money for every host city. Period. Montreal took 31 years to pay off the 1976 games. 31 years. The games that just went over in Vancouver, which are much smaller than the summer games, left the citizens of Vancouver $1.5 billion in debt. And Vancouver, again, has a smaller tax base. So Vancouver, you had um, layoffs in the city. You had departments shut down. You had um, you know, uh, clinics being closed. While the Olympic uh, Organizing Committee paid themselves millions of dollars of bonuses. So that's what we would have been treated to in Chicago. Uh, financially ruinous. That's job. That's number one. So I, I figure, by the way, that uh, our work probably saved you all, if you're taxpayers, you're homeowners, we probably saved you $1,000 each. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Bob. All right, so financially ruinous. Uh, we could just stop there and call it a night, but it's work. It's much more than that. Uh, environmentally disastrous. As we pointed out, a lot of the venues would have been put in parks. Those parks do not belong to the Olympic Committee. They don't belong even to the mayor. They belong to us, and they need to be improved. You know, we celebrated uh, the 100th anniversary of the uh, Burnham Plan last year. Did anybody know that? Everybody know that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. The Burnham Plan. The guy that said, make no small plans. They have no urban's blood. That guy. Well, in his plan, he called for uh, 10 acres of open land for every 1,000 residents. All right? This is 100 years ago. You want to guess what Chicago's number is? 
What do you think? Yes. The answer is 4.3. So we are not even in the top 20 in, in American major cities. So rather than destroying parks, if you're thinking about celebrating the spirit of Burnham, we need to get more parks. We need to double, in, in a way, the amount of parkland in Chicago to just get to what Burnham was calling for 100 years ago. All right, um, and as I say, Washington Park is a, is a, is a, is a place of a great a moment and, a, and a meaning to the African-American community that would have been obliterated. Uh, the University of Chicago, the city of Chicago, between them have purchased 500 vacant lots around Washington Park. And so you have the specter of gentrification and people being pushed out of their homes, which is what happens when the Olympics comes to town. In China, tens of thousands of people lost their homes, people were killed because they wouldn't move and they were bulldozed out and when they protested they were killed. Uh, the for housing and evictions in, in uh, Geneva has done studies on this and is, there's a, like a 300 page report that documents the displacement that happens when the Olympics come to town uh, over the last uh, say 30 years. Alright so environmentally dis disastrous, politically poisonous, it would be the third root reason. Uh, politically poisonous because of one, the issue of displacement, and two, because we know how things work in this city. Every contract that would have been let for the Olympics, there would have been a kickback to the machine. Uh, and we estimate that uh, the, the daily machine and his, uh, his allies would have had tens of millions of dollars to play with. So if you guys are, you know, support the spirit of independence, and you support, uh, you know, radical voices and, and different voices in, in politics, you have to stand against the Olympics because independent politics would have been killed in Chicago and the surrounding for the rest of our lives and our children's lives. That's how much money was at stake. And if it's hard now for a candidate to run for office, and let me tell you, it's fucking hard because uh, that's what I'm doing right now, it would have been impossible for anyone like me uh, or anyone who isn't a machine hack to run for office with any hope of winning. Uh, had the Olympics come here, you can bet on it. So, to recap, financially ruinous, environmentally disastrous, politically poisonous. Those are the reasons we oppose the games. All right, so now, we decided, uh, with our small firepower, to do a few things. One, we held a rally in Federal Plaza when the Olympic organizers came here in April. So what they do is they send a team to each of the four cities. So remember the four cities that we were that were in competition were us, Chicago, Madrid, Rio, and uh, Tokyo. Okay? Four cities in competition for the Olympics. So a group of 13 uh, Olympians um, come to check out the four cities, and we were the first. And what they do is they, they come here and they get wined and dined. Uh, they get in uh, their armored vehicles and they tour the <laughs> venues. And uh, the city basically tries to pull out all the stops and show them how great the city is. And that's what they did here. Well, we followed them everywhere they went. And they kept us away uh, you know, with barricades and whatnot. We got within maybe four blocks of them. But they could see us with our signs and whatnot. They knew we were here. We followed them to the Fairmont Hotel and took a room there. So we were in the Fairmont Hotel with them, slipping things under their doors, calling them on the phone, sending them room service, <laughs> trying to make contact. We held a press conference in front of the Fairmont, and finally they got the message and they invited us to sit with them. This was big, big, big news. You gotta understand something about the IOC. The International Olympic Committee is our last holdout and vestige of feudalism in, in, in the world. This is like a principality. They are a multi-billion dollar operation. The head of it, uh, Mr. Roga, is actually a count, and he is to be addressed as Count Roga. <laughs> oh, Your Excellency. They have diplomatic status, and there are 23 members of the royal families of the world as members of the IOC. And I'm talking about the Duke of Orange, Her Royal Highness the Princess of England, the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi, uh, and a couple other generals and uh, high muftis. 
I kid you not. These people are so far removed from our life uh, that we wouldn't register on them like, a, like an ant would, would be to a normal person. That's how, that's how these guys roll. So that's, 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 that's the people who are going to be holding our, our, our city in their hands. So we're trying to influence them. So they're here in April. We rallied, we marched, and all of a sudden people are taking notice of us. Who are you to, you're pissing in the mirror's lemonade here, you, you nasty people, you're unpatriotic. And that's what happened. People were accusing us of being haters of democracy, haters of Chicago, haters of, uh, of uh, black people or something, because that was going to give, you know, African Americans all kinds of prosperity. So we were called every name in the book. So we met with these uh, IOC guys, uh, and that had never happened before. Because when they recognize you, it's like, it's like diplomatic status. You know, you're recognized. You know, you can kiss my ring, that kind of thing. They're very, very formal in this way. So uh, two of our members gave a 15-minute uh, presentation to six of the uh, IOC delegates, while Lori Healy sat and stewed, and she couldn't say anything. And our argument was basically this. You guys don't want to come here and bring your party because we're going to mess it up. We're going to embarrass you. Look, we're corrupt. We're broke. Uh, our infrastructure can't handle the load. In other words, the CTA can barely move people around now. There's no way it's going to handle a million people, you know, in over three weeks. And, and the people don't want this party. As our signs say, better trains, better schools, better clinics better housing. People in Chicago have other needs besides putting on a $10 million, $10 million party six years from now. And that's the argument we gave the IFC members while Lori Healy, the president of the 2016 Vid Committee, listen. Yeah. <coughs> 10 billion? 10 billion. Not, not 10 billion. 10 billion is what we estimate the cost of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was in early April and we decided uh, about in May, what our main strategy would be. So, our strategy was, there's no point trying to convince the, the city council. They're spineless and worthless. And they'll pretty much do whatever the mayor tells them to do. Uh, so we can't help for, for the, all of them to do their due diligence and actually look out for us. Remember, they just done the parking meter deal, right? So, are they going to all of a sudden find their spine? Okay, so that's not going to help. We didn't have the media on our side. They were cheerleading the games. We had to decide, you know what? Our ultimate target is going to be the IOC members themselves. They're the voters who are going to be meeting in Copenhagen on October 2nd to decide the fate of our city. And that's basically how I looked at it. It's, it's, a, it's an auction. Think of it that way. We had to win an election in which the voters were scattered all over the globe, uh, which a fifth of them were princes and princesses. <laughs> so we had to figure out how to, how to convince them not to vote for Chicago. That was our job. Our first big opportunity came in mid-June, when all four cities came to the uh, headquarters of the IOC, which is in Lausanne, Switzerland. For the first time, the IOC was offering the host cities a chance to pitch one after another the members of the IOC in the one hour meetings, back to back, on a Wednesday. Those meetings were going to be held in the uh, IOC's museum, which is high atop a beautiful little hill with all kinds of beautiful sculpture, athletic sculpture on the grounds of this uh, museum, overlooking Lake Geneva. Uh, so, that's what we decided to do. We prepared, we, we prepared a document called the Book of Evidence. What this is, is 160 pages taken from the uh, pages of uh, the papers documenting that we are corrupt, that we are broke, that our infrastructure is woefully uh, underfunded and crumbling, and that the people don't want this party. So here's one of my favorite headlines. Carruthers wore a wire. We've got stuff in here about Mayor Daly's nephew. We got stuff in here about Al Sanchez going to jail. 
it's, it's delightful bedtime reading. Uh, and you can download your own copy off of our website at no charge. Uh, so uh, we made these books and had them in boxes. And we took them to the IOC's headquarters the day before this meeting that I'm speaking to you about. So President Roosevelt was having a press conference. And uh, we called one of the uh, members of the press. And he pulled his camera crew out of the press conference and met us outside the IOC's international headquarters. Just as we got, uh, we pulled up with a cab, uh, the press crews are out there. And so uh, it looks like Madonna getting out of her limo. You know, this cab pulls up and all of a sudden these guys get out with these boxes and we get swarmed by the press. So these boxes uh, had our logo on it, the No Games logo. And we opened them up and started taking these, these books out and showing them to the press and taking them into the headquarters of the IOC, uh, which is all marble and gold and whatnot. And I say to the receptionist, we are delegates from the people of the city of Chicago. We have documents for the members of the International Olympic Committee. Will you accept them? Oh my God, she didn't know what to do. She's calling security, the alarm is going off. Um, and the cameramen are taking pictures all over the place. Uh, and the head of the, Interna the International Committee's uh, Communications came out to greet me. They said, well, what's going on? I explained our purpose and I said, we have these documents, they must be passed on to your members. It's information that they need in order to do their due diligence. We are doing your work for you. We have information that you need in order to make a good decision. This is information that the city is not going to share. You can bet on it. And I explained to this gentleman what we had and I showed him the book and he said, well, thank you, I will deliver these books. I said, okay, well, tomorrow, on Wednesday, we're going to be in front of your museum passing out these books again and uh, interacting with the press and the public. He said, you're welcome to do so. It's a public park. And I said, you know, man, I love Switzerland. This is a great place. Because <laughs> if this was Chicago, they would have beaten my head. We would have gotten, any, we, you know, we would have gotten like within two miles <laughs> of your meeting. He said, no, no. Uh, it's a public park, you're welcome. And he was true to his word, no one hassled us, we did all the activities that we, were, we needed to do without interference. And so on Wednesday, uh, the next day, uh, we got there bright and early, and uh, we set up a little newsstand in front of the museum. So there's the museum with all these bucketing bucks uh, going in and out. And um, we were giving away these books to anyone who would have them, including, I, gave, I think I gave one to the governor of Tokyo. Um, and then there was, the, there was like the governor general of Brazil, or rather of a, the, Rio, the province of Rio de Janeiro. I mean, it was, it was a, a circus. So between the press conference at the, in front of the IOC headquarters and this action in front of the museum, I think we gave, and then the, giving the books to the IOC members, I think we gave away 150 copies. Now, you have to understand, this is, no one has ever done this before. This is unprecedented, this is unheard of, that citizens would come all the way to the IOC's headquarters to say, no, thank you. But our position was, we're in touch with the folks in Chicago and our priorities. We're speaking for the city better than the President of the United States or the mayor. They're out of touch. And so that was how we, was, we were presenting ourselves. And uh, it made headlines everywhere except one place. That's right. You guys could have lived a long and happy life and never known there was anything called No Game Chicago. However, in, in front of, you know, on the, in the uh, radios and TVs of Brazil, uh, uh, Japan, and Spain, and, and, and many other countries that follow the Olympics, we were an international sensation. For both of those days, as I say, we were on the Tuesday in front of the IOC headquarters, we were done by about 6 o'clock. Uh, we were all up, the, the, our, 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 delegate, our delegation of the three, the three public people with the one spy. Uh, the, we were on the phone and texting and emailing and, and uh, updating our website and doing interviews for 10 hours straight. And the same thing the next day after we got home from being at the museum, uh, we were, I, I think, I, I think I didn't get sleep. 
it was 24 hours. That's how, that's, that's what a hot subject this was, except yeah, for Chicago. Now, you know, I guess that brings up another issue, and that is the role of the media in our modern body politics. Uh, we believe that the media completely abandoned the people of Chicago on this issue and many, many other issues. So I'm sure you've had many speakers over the years talk about the role of the media in society and how worthless and bankrupt they are and how they are not doing their jobs to protect us and to keep us informed. And let me tell you, they completely dropped the ball on the Olympic vision. So uh, there we were. <clears throat> and uh, on, on Thursday, uh, there was more private meetings at the Palace Hotel. The Palace Hotel is the swankiest place in, one of the swankiest places in Europe. It makes a drink hotel look like a flop house. <laughs> that's, that's what a big deal it is. And on that day, uh, there were just private meetings between the IFC members and the various city delegations. So we, the members of uh, Go Game Chicago, just put on our best clothes and sat around the lobby for about five hours, sipping Cokes and, and, and hobnobbing with the IOC delegates and the members of the other city uh, uh, delegations. So of course we didn't have our identifiers on. We were just, we looked potentially like, you know, I don't know, maybe we were members of the media or, but of course, as soon as we started talking with somebody, we would give them our No Games card. And people were deeply interested in why we were there. Many of them said, oh, I really shouldn't be talking to you. Why are you here? <laughs> and so we met with members of the press. And uh, Mar Martin Macias Jr., uh, the a member of our delegation, was only 20 years old, was speaking Spanish with the uh, members of the Madrid delegation and also with the Portuguese, with the members of the Brazilian delegation. Uh, then, at about 5 o'clock on Thursday, a big bus pulls up in front of the Palace Hotel, and all the IOC members are now being ushered onto the bus to be taken to a, a private reception. So I, I stood in front of the bus, and, uh, and again, I, I kind of had a nice suit on, so I made it look like I should be there. And as every member of the IOC got on the bus, I shook their hand and gave them my business card. <laughs> said, Hello, I'm Tom Tresser with Bill Game Chicago. Don't come to Chicago. And the guy said, excuse me? You know what? You, and one guy said, you, you are serious? You, you, you did not want the Olympic Games? Why? And I said, well, they'll, they'll back up the city and we'll muck it up, we'll embarrass you. You don't want to come here. Oh, okay. And so I just got, I got the personal one-on-one -on -one time with about 20 of these guys. So that was our time in Switzerland. And that established a bond. Because as I say, these guys are old school. They really want to be wined and dined. They really want to be have their rings kissed. And once we had that personal relationship, we were able to actually communicate with them. So because I told you we had a spy, we were able to get this. This is the directory of all the IOC members with their addresses, phone numbers, and emails. Top secret. We're not supposed to have that. So, starting on July 24th, uh, 70 days before the decision, we emailed the members of the IRC a newsletter once a day, every day, rain or shine, and each email simply was one article from that day's paper that bucked up our argument. We're corrupt, we're broke, our infrastructure is falling apart, and the people don't want this party. There was never any editorializing. It was simply, here is an article from the Sun-Times, the Reader, the Tribune, what have you, the Wall Street Journal. Remember we said that, that blank, blank, blank? Remember we told you that such and such a thing? Well, here is an example. So for example, Cal Brown, the chairman of the CTA, gave a private talk to uh, a mass transit association in which she said that the CTA had $8 billion of unfunded repairs. Now that didn't make headlines, but we found it. And we sent that to the IOC. He said, you know, remember we told you that, the, that our CTA is in bad repair? He was the chair of the CTA. You know, we're not making this up. Every day, when Michael Scott got caught with his hands in the cookie jar, Michael Scott being the president of the Board of Ed, and also the chair of the uh, Outreach Committee of the 2016 Committee, the Tribune caught him doing a secret deal to get land near one of the Olympic venues. for He got uh, lots for a dollar. Headlines. 
The Olympic, the headline was, Olympic Insider Gets Sweet Deal. We sent them that article, and we said, look, this is how it's done here in Chicago. These people are, are corrupt, and it's entirely possible that the people that you're dealing with will be in jail <laughs> by the time you get here, including the mayor. It's entirely possible. Remember, Carruthers wore a wire for a year, and he still hasn't told us what he, who he picked. That has yet to come out. Bogdanovich's trial was yet to happen. Sergej's trial was going on. Um, all these things were happening, and so what we said was, look, there's three federal investigations that we know of. Um, it's, a it's a terribly unstable situation. Do you want to operate under these conditions when um, the people you're dealing with will actually be in prison? <laughs> uh, so I mean, any day, every day, as I say, we sent them a, an email, and we know who dubbed the emails. Every day, between 15 and 20 members of the IOC read our emails. And two people read every one of them. They were the chair of the Brazilian delegation and the chair of the Tokyo delegation. <laughs> All right? So they opened every single one of them multiple times. All right, so now um, the, uh, the season is wearing on. Um, when we were in Switzerland, uh, the mayor tried to begin with the IOC. And this is something that is just so extraordinary. And it, again, goes to the sort of why, one of the reasons why they lost. They try to, to do the Chicago-style politicking on the IOC. They're so used to getting their way uh, that they don't realize that these people are literally princes and princesses in their own right. And so they try to negotiate the finances in a way that the IOC simply is not used to negotiating. There's something called the host city contract that every finalist city has to, has to sign. So each of the four mayors must sign this document before the actual decision is made. And the host city contract is not a secret. It's well known. It's in the Olympic Charter. It simply says uh, that the IOC bears no financial burden whatsoever, and that if you are the host city, if you're chosen, you must produce the games and the village. And they don't care how they do it. So you can get someone like Sam Zell, for example, to write a check, and he can take the whole thing on, right? Or, you know, Warren, Warren uh, Oates, or whatever his name is. Warren, yeah, that, uh, that guy. Or <laughs> Bill Gates, or somebody like that. It's of no interest to the IC how it's done. It just must be done. They get their, their cut off the top, and it's on to the city, and whoever can pay for it, to pay for it. And that contract must be signed before the decision date, which is October 2nd. Now we had that, we had a, the host city contract that Vancouver signed and that London signed on our website. So it wasn't hard to find. We found it. Why couldn't the alderman find it? They seemed not to know about this. So at the session that I told you about in uh, Switzerland, uh, they were trying to negotiate. And essentially, the IOC said to the mayor, sign the fucking paper, or you're dead. This meeting was over, and your bid is over. And so from that meeting, uh, the mayor went to a press conference and announced that he was going to sign something called the host city contract. And all of a sudden, it's big news here. We use the term blank check. And that's the term that I picked up. In other words, he had to sign the blank check. So there was such a firestorm of protest that the mayor decided that the IOC, the 2016 committee had to go to every community in the city over the summer, and you had the 50 wards in 50 days. Remember that? What a long summer that was. We went to every meeting, every single one of them. At first, they wouldn't let us in. We couldn't pass our flyers, and we couldn't bring in our signs until we broke that story and embarrassed them. And then eventually, we didn't even need to bring in our signs because people were getting angrier and angrier as the summer went on. They wanted to know, why are we having the meetings now? It's a done deal, isn't it? Isn't that how Chicago rolls? What are you coming to us now? People were angry. We just got out of the way. But we were there documenting this thing in every meeting. So the summer wore on, and now it's coming on to the fall, and um, it's time for the city council to vote. 
Now, originally, the city council voted for $500 million guarantee. Uh, they said, oh, there's no chance this is going to be going to be used. It's just to have skin in the game. We need to show the IOC that we, were, we have good faith. Uh, and that, that law was passed, and it was on the books, but it wasn't enough. The host city contract has no limit on it. And so they needed to go back to the council to, to ratify the host city contract for the blank check. Alderman Manny Flores introduced an ordinance that would have capped our Olympic uh, commitment at $500 million. But he got brought off, and that bill never saw the light of day. And what happened to Manny? He went to the state to become the new head of the, the uh, Commerce Commission. That was his reward. So his bill was introduced and then withdrawn, and there was never any hearing on it. And we told Manny, we said, Manny, we support your bill because if that bill passes, that kills the bid. And we're, we're, that's, that's our end goal. He says, I don't want to kill the bid. I think, I think the, the Olympics are good, and I'm willing to spend $500 million. I said, Manny, if you declare for mayor right now, in July of 2009, on the, on the ticket of no to the contract, no to the bid, and take the meters back, you'll be the next mayor of Chicago. <laughs> he didn't listen to me. We said the same thing to all of the Waggis back, by the way. He said, Scott, you want to be the next mayor of Chicago? Come out against the bid now, and on the, on the idea that if, the, if we get the contract, if we get the bid, you'll cancel the contract as the next mayor, and you're going to take the meters back. The people would carry you around on their shoulders. They'll be throwing money at you. He didn't have the balls to do it. <clears throat> so uh, on September 9th, uh, the city council met, and each alderman stood up and praised the mayor for his vision and uh, what a great thing that it is, and what a blessing it is, and how it's going to save the children <laughs> and save the, save the polar bears, and on and on and on. Um, what an embarrassing day for Civic, for Civic Chicago to hear these morons. He prays on the mayor and the bid, um, despite all the, all the knowledge that was out there, and all the research that we had done. And even now, the press was starting to report a little bit of some of the, some of the cracks in the armor. No, he wouldn't have known it. So talk about Alderman Wagesback, who I really like, actually. He was going to cast the one no vote. This is also new information, never before reported. Except he was visited by Alderman after Alderman. The mayor was looking at him. I think he sits pretty close to the podium. And the mayor was getting lit. He was going to have a stroke. Because he thought Wagesback was going to vote no. And he can't, he can't have even a 48 to 1. There was one alderman who was resigned by then, so it was 49 on the floor. It couldn't even be 48 to 1. It had to be unanimous. So alderman after alderman was coming up to Scott saying, they'll kill you. They, you know, they'll never pick the trash up in your ward. They'll never plow the snow. They'll never, you know, I mean, it was, it was like that. Scott was going to resign. He was so sick. And he said, you know, finally, I, I had to go with the, with, the, with the Olympics. And, you know, in, in retrospect, again, having the one no vote, it could have made his political career. Instead, Scott went along. Uh, you know, he put, he put I, I guess, the interest of his ward uh, first in that regard. Uh, so the result, 49 to 0. So that was the blank check signed in your name. All right, now we're getting close to decision day, October 2nd. The same crew that goes to Copenhagen. I should say, by the way, we went to Switzerland on my credit card. We had no idea of how it was going to be paid back, but No Game Chicago promised me that we would hold a fundraiser once we got back, uh, which we never did. <laughs> so that's something that No Games people let me down on. But eventually, through small donations, we were able to pay me back, and my wife did divorce me, thank God. But now we had some donors come forward for Copenhagen, and so we had the plane fare and the hotels donated. So it was a much different situation. And the three of us, plus the secret spy, that's four of us, went to Copenhagen. Now this is a much different situation than Switzerland. Switzerland was pleasant and open and uh, easy to travel. Uh, Copenhagen, because of the heads of state were there, the president of course was there, the president of uh, Brazil, I think the king of Spain was there. You had the Danish army, the Copenhagen police, the American Secret Service, and Monterey security, the private security form brought over by the mayor 
Danny Solis's brother owns that firm. So you had four rings of security guarding every hotel where we wanted to go. Uh, we went to one hotel where we thought we might meet with some of the 2016 staffers and some of the Olympic staff people. Uh, but the uh, 2016 people called the security on us and we were going and they walked us to the, to the cab stand. I wouldn't leave until we were, you know, in the cab and gone. But the, the Marriott was where we really needed to go, and that's where Michelle Obama was staying. So there were guys with machine guns at the door. They put up a whole other entrance where you had to go through metal detectors, uh, and it was a scary environment. And that's where we needed to go with our last bit of evidence. So we made 115 copies of documents that included uh, the, the tribute poll that said that only 47% of the people supported the bid and 84% did not want to pay for it. So that was a nice article with this graphic. We went with this postcard itself. Uh, we went with um, a great article from the Tribune called um, uh, something like Chicago, Boundless History of Corruption. <laughs> so that was a nice article. Uh, and we also went with an article talking about the uh, $200 million deficit that the city was facing. So there was like four pieces plus the postcard, 110 copies. And uh, so I was dressed in a suit, and Martine sort of looked uh, maybe like my helper or something. So we looked kind of semi-official. We walked up to the uh, doorman. So there's a guy in the red outfit with a, uh, you know, like a beefeater hat, like the guy that guards the Tower of London. So very ceremonial. Standing next to him are two guys in flak jackets with machine guns. So he went up to the doorman and said, uh, we uh, have some official documents that we need to deliver your guests. Will you walk us up to the security police? So he just took us right in. He took us past the checkpoints, and we just walked like you knew what we were doing. You know, I guess, you know, bluffing and just sort of confidence goes a long way. So we just strolled in, passed all this, and uh, said to the desk guy, we have information for the IOC that must be delivered. Uh, so they fetched over someone from the IOC, and we explained what we had, and she said, well, you can't actually leave anything here. It has to be first checked by our ethics committee. And they said, well, I'm not leaving like a gold watch. You know, I'm not trying to bribe anybody. This is just paper information that you need to give to Mark Adams, the director of communications, in order to be delivered to the members of the IOC. This is information they need, and it should be delivered. She said, oh, well, hold on, let me, let me call. So she gets Mark on the phone, and then she says, okay, Mark has told me that I have to take this information. And I tried to take her picture, and she turned her back on me. <laughs> and I said, well, who are you? And so she finally turned over her, her badge, and you know, I got her name and her position with the IOC Communications Department. So at that point, passing on that last piece of information, while the guys with the machine guns were watching, while the guys from 2016 were watching, our job was over. In the sense, we've now done all we could to pass this information on to the decision makers, the IOC members, the people who are going to be meeting in a matter of 24 hours to decide our future. Um, but just then, uh, and I was, I, Martin had my camera, and I wanted to take a picture to document this moment. He told me the day before that um, Pele was his idol. So I, I should tell you, you know, we sent Oprah to influence, so she's running around town. And they sent Pele. And everywhere where Pele went, there was like a riot. You know, they loved him. He, you know, he stopped traffic. He'd take out a ball and he'd start playing. And I mean, it was just, he would just create a sensation everywhere he went. Well, Martinez, a soccer player, and he told me, you know, if I could just meet Pele, I could die happy. <laughs> so now here we are in the hotel lobby. And I'm saying, and, and, and this, this Dramatic moment is about to happen, and he's got the camera, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden Tom, he says, Tom, Tom, it's him, it's him. And he runs across the room, and there's Pell. And he, he takes the camera with him, and he gets his picture took with his idol while I'm passing on these papers to the IOC. <laughs> and I tell you, if, 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 you, if, you, if you, you couldn't make something like that up. <laughs> so he has the moment of his life. <laughs> We shall talk about forever. And I have that picture still on my camera. I haven't deleted it. Um, so uh, we're done. And now it's the morning of October 2nd. 
and um, it's a drizzly day in Copenhagen. The president's uh, Air Force warm lands and drizzle. He alights with his brick new. Uh, there's a caravan of maybe 30 vehicles slowly moving through the rain uh, with their blue flashing lights. Of course, it's on the news live. We're watching in our hotel lobby. We're very dispirited. Um, you know, we're exhausted. And uh, we had thought to deliver a letter to the American Embassy with a letter to the president saying, you know, it's not too late, <laughs> turn back. <laughs> we thought, but you know what? <laughs> no, no, never mind. We didn't do that. And um, the conventional wisdom, we have to pause for a moment to remind ourselves that now in the retrospect of what happened, it's hard to remember, but the common logic was that the bid was ours to lose. Right or wrong, that's what people thought. That's what was out there. You know, the odds makers, the pundits that they paraded endlessly on television for the previous year, all the scholars, everybody was saying, it's going to be between Chicago and Rio. And depending on how the votes go, and the geopolitics of President Obama working his magic, and deep and deep and deep, and the African delegates will vote, will vote for America because of an African-American president, a lot of just endless chatter. The pressure was really on uh, us. We thought for sure we were a very strong contender. And, and hence, even more the, the insanity of our, of our organizing efforts. Well, so the uh, American delegation made its way to the Bella Center, where all uh, members of the IRC were present. Uh, and each city made its presentation in turn. Uh, started by the head of the delegation, and then they're, and they're the, sort of the, uh, concluded by their heavy hitter, you know, whoever their uh, senior person was. So, in the case of America, of course, President Obama, you know, did, did bad cleanup batting. And in the case of Brazil, it was President Lula who sort of drove their, their presentation home. So I watched uh, President Obama do his speech from a hotel room while I was live on the radio in Australia. And they didn't have a live feed, so while I was being, while I was talking, you know, she, the, the, the interviewer wanted me to hold the phone up to the, to the television so she could hear what Obama was saying live. Talk about um, a, a strange media moment. Um, I also did uh, a YouTube video immediately following the, the president's speech, so I, I actually composed a response. Uh, while I was watching it, and then I had Martine turn a little camera on me, and I, you know, was able to go right from the president to me, doing a two-minute response, which we put up on the web instantly. So, you know, within ten minutes of the president's speech, we actually had a response live on the internet. <clears throat> and now um, each city did their thing in turn, um, and I thought, you know, Michelle Obama was, you know, okay. And I thought the president was just okay, but not great. In fact, I thought the president was kind of lackluster. and gave kind of like a stump speech. It seemed to me that it was the kind of speech that you, he might have made anywhere in America. You know, the, the same kind of platitudes and images. and uh, it, Not that he didn't really know what audience he was in front of, it seemed to me. And the same thing for Michelle. Um, whereas Lula was pounding the table, we are ready, we are ready, we love the Olympics. And, you know, they, they were totally in tune with, 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 with the space and place. Anyway, uh, all the presentations are over, and the rest of our team was out scouting the Copenhagen Plaza, which is where the final announcement was going to be made about 5 o'clock local time. They would take the vote right now and eliminate the two losers, but you wouldn't know who the winners were. So that would be announced live, and um, that's where we thought we needed to be at 5 o'clock local time, because remember, the conventional wisdom was going to be Chicago versus Rio. So they were out scouting locations where we should be, where, we, where our signage should be, how we were going to interact with the press. That's what they were figuring out. While I was watching this thing live, I got a call from the team that they were on their way back to the hotel room to report just as the voting was concluded, and they had this long, got dry kind of explanation from this guy from Germany. He said, eh, you, you, you must uh, take the tabulation, and won't you will uh, make the notations and lock in your... And it was just this 15-minute long explanation 
of how to vote with their electronic voting pads. Uh, then Tyler Roger said, I now declare the voting open. Please use your keys to make your vote. This is silence. Is everybody have the opportunity to vote who wishes to do so? I now declare the voting closed. And then the people sort of at the screens, you know, you know, making notes. They make something on a paper. The person walks with the paper. I'm having a heart, like 16 heart attacks from this. They hand the paper to the president. The president reads the paper. And he leans in and he says, Chicago, having received the fewest number of votes, is eliminated from the competition. <laughs> what the hell? Just then, the team walks off the elevator and I'm running out of the lobby going, it's over, it's over, we won, it's done, we're out. And they're going, what, what, what? And we're, we're crying and we're, oh, we're, we're slapping each other on the back and we're falling on the floor. And there's a sense of relief that we did it. We, we won, it's over. And now our phones start ringing, and basically we're, you know, between the four of us, or three of us, the, the spy, of course, nobody really knew that she was there. We're basically on the phone for another 20 hours. So we come back to Chicago, and, you know, the story still hasn't been told. This story that I'm telling you now has simply not been told. You are the only people, and there's maybe another 50 people, who have heard the story. I think the story deserves to be told. I think the people of No Game Chicago deserve something, some recognition. But larger, larger than that, what are the bigger lessons as we face you know, the elections next year? Some people say uh, that one of the reasons why the mayor resigned is because, or he retired, is because we didn't get the games. And if that's true, then No Game Chicago deserves some Kudos for chasing the mayor out of Chicago and having him retire. Now, before you think that Tresser is just delusional, because the question has been asked, that's a fair question. How do you know you made a difference? Well, maybe the, the IOC hates Americans. You know, maybe, you know, maybe Martians came and you know, messed up their little voting machines. So there are all sorts of theories and again, it's part of the undigested BS that is the Chicago media, because following the loss, there was like a sense of mourning. Oh, we didn't get the games, we didn't get the jobs, you know, all like that. And again, that is part of the same BS that fueled the bit. So there wasn't any crit criticism or critical thinking before, and there wasn't any critical thinking after about what really happened. So here's how we know we made a difference. I already told you. A few ways. We know that the IOC members received our emails and opened them, and we, we know who they were and how often they did so. We know that um, our spy met with President Roga. Of course, the, the president didn't know that this person was a No Games agent, and the president said to this, uh, the, the spy said to the President Roga, "What about this No Games stuff? You, you know, who are they?" And, this, and basically, we're, we were told that the IOC knew who we were and respected us. They were particularly impressed by this. This, the postcard, that was part of our package, remember? But we also mailed this to them separately. So this had been received twice by them and made a big deal. Also, I met with a guy who was the head of the strategy for Brazil. So in the airport going home, I saw a guy with the Brazil badge on him. I said, well, you must be happy. He saw my no games face. He said, "Well, you must be happy too." <laughs> and he said, "Well, yeah, I guess we're both kind of happy." And he's a British guy. And he took me aside and he said, "Look, I was the head of international relations for the IOC for 20 years, but Brazil reached out and hired me, and I managed their strategy." So this guy was at the top of the house for Brazil. He said, "Your finances were very questionable, but..." When public support for the bid goes below 50%, you're cooked. The bid is cooked. And I submit to you that 
the way the public support got to 47% was solely due to the work of no games, because there was nobody out there criticizing the bid, right? I'm not aware of any other group that was putting this out there, maintained a website, was on the TV, was in the newspapers, was at 50 meetings, but actually it was more like 75 meetings. But more than that, we communicated this information directly to the ISC, so that's the only way they would know that the, that the public support here was suppressed. So he said, when the bid support is down below 47%, your bid is cooked. So, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that No Game Chicago can take a fair credit, a fair amount, not by any means exclusive, but a fair share of the credit for derailing the Olympic bid and saving everyone in this room who owns property at least $1,000 and saving Chicago this, you know, years and years of scandal and, and overruns and all the stuff that we know that happens with big construction projects. We don't have to worry about it. We can concentrate on more important things like trying to figure out how to get our city out from under the mess that it's in. Uh, maybe some electing a progressive mayor, if that's possible, electing some progressive aldermen, and trying to fix the city that we love so much. So that's the story of No Game Chicago and the battle for the bid. And uh, I guess for the time remaining, we can take questions and have a conversation.